Hello and welcome to this webinar, which is the Advanced Train the Trainer webinar. Uh, probably a follow-up for most of you from the Train the Trainer webinar we did last month. Thank you for coming back and for attending this. Uh, as I mentioned when uh, promoting this webinar and when talking about it with you previously, this particular session is focused very, very much on the psychology of the training process, both your psychology and how you experience yourself as the trainer and the psychology of the people who attend your sessions, whether that's online or in person. Most of you are choosing to attend this webinar uh, in an on-demand mode. In other words, you're not actually here, you're listening back to this at your own convenience, which is great. Uh, it does mean there will probably be fewer questions this time around, um, but if you do have any questions about this webinar, feel free to send them to me by email afterwards and I'd be happy to answer them. So with that in mind, let's get on with the webinar. So the structure by, with which you'll, most of you will be familiar um, and the schedule of the webinar is we do 20 to 25 minutes and the first 20 to 25 minutes, as I said, will be focused on your psychology. In other words, what it is that you are bringing to the experience as a trainer and how you experience the training process. Uh, then we'll have a short break if we need one, uh, and that will be followed by another 20-25 minutes talking about the psychology of the people who attend your sessions, the people who go to your speeches or conference presentations. So that will be the split of the webinar, initially talking about you and your, your own state as you are presenting and then talking about others and how to make sure that you're communicating effectively to the other people. So the biggest issue that anyone faces when they want to offer training or speak with people in groups uh, in whatever format that is, is the fear of public speaking. And there, there is no getting away with, from it. That There's no getting away from that. It may seem like it's a strange place to start because I know that most of you are experienced speakers, experienced trainers. I've had a look at every one of your profiles. So I know who you are. And I know that some of you have already given many talks and many presentations and you go to conferences. And yet I know also that any speaker at whatever uh, level they are, however experienced they are, nonetheless an element of dealing with presenting, of dealing with public speaking is the fear of it. Uh, it's something that's very natural. Now, there are many different reasons for it. Um, and I, I like this quote from uh, Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian says that at a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket, in other words, they'd rather be the one being buried than the person doing the eulogy. Um, so fear of public speaking is very pervasive, uh, and the reasons for that are, are manifold. They're biological and evolutionary reasons, um, and there's a, a great uh, biology um, expert called Desmond Morris who writes quite at length about what it is that causes people uh, to be the way they are in terms of the evolutionary process. And one of the things I remember from some of his books is he talks about the fact that it's a very natural response to experience fear when you have a large number of other individuals of your species staring at you without saying anything. And if you've spoken to an audience face to face, you will know that that's one of the things that you initially confronted by. Uh, particularly the first time that you do it is there you are sitting or standing in front of a large number of people and they're just staring at you. Um, so that that's something that's quite natural and I remember actually an example of this from my own childhood when I was a teenager. Uh, we went to the zoo with a couple of my friends uh, and uh, we approached a gorilla enclosure and there was a sign on the gorilla enclosure which said do not stare the gorillas in the eyes they see this as a threat and they get agitated and angry about that. Obviously, being teenagers, we wanted to try it out for ourselves. So we started to stare the gorilla in the eyes and very, very quickly the gorilla became very angry and nearly smashed <laughs> the enclosure wall down. So uh, it's something that's very natural in the human existence and in the existence of animals that being stared at is something that makes most creatures uncomfortable. 
There are also mental reasons uh, that people experience fear of public speaking, and that is because most of us experience life through the prism of looking a certain way and not looking a certain way. We want to look good and we want to avoid looking bad. We all want to look good, we want to look intelligent, we want to look interesting, we want to look funny enough, or funny enough, or interesting enough, or smart enough. And we're afraid of not looking bad. All of us are afraid of being judged. We're afraid of looking bad, we're afraid of looking stupid, we're afraid of looking boring, or unfunny, or whatever else it may be. And that is just the experience of life that every human being has. No matter how spiritually enlightened you are, no matter how advanced you are in, in your own understanding of yourself or of life, of the universe, or whatever that might be, all human beings experience life through this prism, through the prism of, am I being judged right now? Am I liked right now? Do these people like me? Do they think I'm an idiot? Whatever it is, that internal dialogue that's going on in every person's head, that aspect of it is always there. And so to go in front of people and speak to people is to expose yourself to that aspect of your own experience. Uh, if you're sitting at home on your own doing your own thing, then the reason that you can be comfortable with that and not afraid because there's no one watching, there's no one judging, there's no one evaluating whether you're good or smart or funny or not. As soon as you put yourself in front of a group of people, all of those things that are latent, all of those things that exist within you come to the surface. And that's why a lot of people find it a very uncomfortable experience, even if they've been doing it for a very long time. And it's not something that you necessarily get past. Uh, you know, I've been a trainer for many years now, I've spoken at dozens of conferences, run hundreds of different sessions, webinars, in-person training, etc. But every time I'm getting ready for a presentation, I experience an element of that myself. So it may diminish with time, uh, but nonetheless, the experience is uh, the same for all human beings. Uh, I've read biographies of people who are music stars, world famous musicians or comedians at the very top of the business and all of them uh, talk about how they do breathing exercises backstage before their gigs and so on because they have the same fear of going out before hundreds and thousands of people as we do talking to 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 people the same way. So it's a universal human experience. Uh, the way that you experience it is particular to you but the fact that you have that experience is a human universal. You're not going to get away from that. And equally, you know that you're not alone. So how do you overcome that? How do you get past that? Well, the best advice that I can give you is to get over it, to get over the fact that you're going to have this experience. You are going to experience fear and reluctance and hesitation sometimes when it comes to speaking with other people. It's just the fact. Another important fact is, yes, you are being judged. You are constantly being judged and you constantly judge others. When you meet a person for the first time, you judge them on the basis of their appearance, on what they say, on what they look like, on how they dress. And other people are doing that all the time as well. Judgment is a fact of our lives and it's happening all the time. There is no way to get away from it. The only thing you can do is just accept that that is what's happening, that you do it and other people do it to you. The reason that you are in front of other people is that you're a leader. You are seeking to lead people, you're seeking to communicate information that allows people to change their lives, that allows them to do what they do better, more effectively. And we'll talk about what exactly it is that you're doing a little bit later on, but for now I just invite you to think of yourself as a leader. And most people tend not to do that. Most people, even when they are doing training, even when they are giving presentations, don't want to put themselves in that position. But actually you are in that position. If you're running training events, if you are a trainer, if you are a speaker, then that's what you are. You are on your own, with a group of people and you are seeking to lead them to something, whether that's an understanding of something or new information or whatever that is, you are seeking to be a leader. 
And what does it mean to be a leader? Well, being a leader is about focusing on something that's greater than you. That is what being a leader is. Is focusing on something that's not just about you. A great leader is not someone who constantly worries about how they look or what they what they are doing. What they are interested in is what is that they're trying to create in the world for other people. And if you think about the people that we would traditionally associate with leadership and achievement in that area, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, these are all people who had something greater at stake than just their own life. In fact, they gave up in, in different cases their own life or decades of their own life in prison or wherever else for a greater goal. Now, I'm not saying that you are, you are Nelson Mandela or you're Gandhi or you're Martin Luther King, but at lower levels of leadership, it's nonetheless the same. The way to be a leader and the way to overcome any fears that you may have is to focus on whatever it is that you're trying to create that's greater than you. Your true voice, therefore, comes from delivering that message that is not just about you, not about you trying to look intelligent or you trying to be clever or you trying to be funny. Your true voice comes from actually sharing whatever it is that you want to share with people for them, sharing that message that's beyond just your own existence and your own importance. Which leads us to a natural question, what is your message? What is your message really? What is the message inside your message? If you're teaching people, for example, to use cat tools effectively, is that really all that there is to your message? I don't think so. I think if that's what you're doing, then the message you're saying, you're sending to people is, you can do more with less. You can have more free time. You can make more money. You can work less, or you can be more efficient. And they're all messages that are inside that message. So if you if you wear away at the kind of superficial stuff that you think your message is, what are you left with? What are you really saying to people? And if you remember, if you attended the previous webinar where I talked about your message as well, it's really something that has to be very clear for you in a very concise and compact way. It has to be something very precise that you can know instantly what it is. If someone wakes you up in the middle of the night and puts a gun to your head and says, what is the message? You've got to have the answer ready in a packaged, concise format. Because it's only by knowing that that you can be truly effective as a presenter, as a speaker, and as a leader. You can only communicate effectively when you know what it is that you're saying and the basis and the rationale for saying it. If you don't know that, then your communication will not come across powerfully. Now, what is the biggest chunk message? If you think about what I just said about cat tools, for example, that's something very specific. Well, what is the biggest level of your message? Is it that people can have more freedom in their life, or people can have more success in their life, or they can achieve more if only they apply these particular techniques? What is it that you're really telling people? It's the biggest chunk of the message. And what is it that you want to make possible for others? Do you want to make it possible for them to earn more money while working less? Do you want to make it possible for people to have more freedom? Do you want to make it possible for people to pursue a career in an industry that you know is great for them, like the translation industry, for example, if you're working with people who are not sure whether they should join this industry or not? So what is it that you want to make possible for people out of doing your programs, out of doing your webinars, out of doing your trainings? Really, really think about that right now. What is it that you're actually creating for other people? If you're only concerned with yourself and what you look like and what you appear like and what someone is doing and how they're judging you and all the rest of it, the outcome of that is self-consciousness. That's how you create that self-consciousness that everyone who's been in front of a group of people has experienced at one point or another. And confidence on stage or ability to speak with people comes from the opposite. It comes from the ability to focus on something that's beyond yourself. If you're concerned with other people, if you're concerned with what it is that they need to get, 
if your attention is out there instead of in here, inside of you, that is something that helps to overcome any sense of self-consciousness that you may have. If you're conscious of others, you're not conscious of self. And that really is the way to overcome it, to focus on the greater message and what it is that you're trying to create for other people. And what is it that they need right now? What is, what is it that they need to hear from you right now? How can you impact their lives powerfully? That is something that makes it much easier to communicate with people and experience that as a relaxing, enjoyable process, as opposed to the self-conscious, self-focused approach where you only think about how you look in the situation, how you appear in the situation. And this, you know, talking about fear, I, I love this this quote um, from Aaron Williamson, which is really at the core, I think, of everything that we're afraid of when we're, we're speaking in public or doing anything else. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people will not feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone, and as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I think that's a beautiful way of expressing exactly what leadership is about. As we let go of our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So as a leader, as a speaker, when you overcome your own self-consciousness and when you overcome your own fear, you allow other people to do the same in your presence. So don't play small, play big. Now, how do you do that? Well, one of the things that, again, concerns people when they're, they're, pub they're doing public speaking or they're speaking with groups of people or doing trainings and so on is standing out. And, you know, standing out is hard because it requires you to let go of what other people might think. Being different is something that is automatically judged in our world. It is automatically judged in our society. And you have to let go of that if you're going to be different and special. I love this quote, quote from Eleanor Roosevelt who said, you wouldn't worry so much about what others think of you if you realized how seldom they do, how rarely they think of that. And, and that's because most people are usually so worried about how they look, they have little time actually to be looking at you and judging you too much. And so the solution to the worry of what other people might think about you is to not be interested in that and just to let go of that. And if you think about anyone who is special and anyone who is anyone, typically they're different from the norm. You know, whoever you admire, they, you admire them because they were different, because they were special, because they did things that other people were afraid to do, or other people refused to do, or other people were not tenacious enough to do, or not courageous enough to do. So if you want to be a speaker and if you want to be a leader, you have to develop the comfort to be different. You have to be, develop the comfort with being different. That is the only way that you will be an effective communicator and an effective leader when you're comfortable with who you are because we're all special and we're all different and sometimes we've been trained to conceal that and to hide that and the way you become really powerful and the way you become an effective communicator is to embrace that, to embrace the fact that you're special and to embrace the fact that you're different. Now, the one thing that is a practical bit of advice that I would give at this stage, as I've acknowledged throughout the first half of the webinar, you will experience fear and discomfort as a public speaker at different points in time. It's natural. It happens to everybody. The anticipation will sometimes be even worse than the actual practical experience. You might be more worried about speaking before you start speaking. But one great thing 
that you can do to prepare yourself and you can do to pace yourself properly during a presentation or during the webinar is to remember to breathe. I always say playfully that one of the biggest differences between someone who's dead and who's alive is that one is breathing and one isn't. And if you want to stay alive, literally and metaphorically, it's really, really important to breathe. One of the things about breathing is it's connected very closely to your emotional state and it's connected with speech. You cannot speak without breathing. And so if you breathe in a certain deliberate manner and if you remember to breathe, it forces you to speak in a certain way. Now in terms of your emotional state, how you breathe de determines and reflects how you feel. If you think about someone who's anxious and nervous, they'll be speaking and breathing very quickly, sometimes hyperventilating, as opposed to someone who's calm and relaxed. They'll be taking deep, calm, long breaths. And the connection works the other way around. If you take deep, calm, long breaths, you will become calm and relaxed. So when you're speaking with people and you find yourself going a little bit too quickly, or feeling a little bit anxious, the most important thing is to breathe. And even as I've been talking about breathing right now, whether you may have noticed that my own speech rate and my own breathing has slowed down as well, because that is the process that works. If you breathe, you slow down, and you speak in a very different way. And the experience of listening to someone who is breathing and speaking in a calm and relaxed way is also different. You feel more at ease, you feel more relaxed, you feel calmer, you may feel a little drowsy too. So there's a balance to be struck, but the most important thing is that you remember to breathe. It's really, really important. So at this point, ordinarily, uh, I would take a break, but I think that given how quickly we're moving forward with things and we haven't, I don't see any questions so far, so at this rate, I think we can just keep going straight through to the second half of the webinar. Now, we talked in the first half of the webinar about you. We're going to take a break from that, and we're going to talk about other people or how you communicate with other people. Now, something that you'll be very, very familiar with uh, as a concept is that people perceive the world differently. We're all different and the reason that we're all different is partly because we perceive the world in different ways. And I'm not just talking about differences of opinion. You know, one person votes for Republicans, the other person votes for Democrats or one person thinks a certain government policy is good and another one thinks it's bad. I'm talking about our perception of the world at a much deeper core primitive basic level about how we experience the world that is outside of us. Now a lot of what I'm going to talk about comes from Neuro Linguistic Programming or NLP uh, which is a way of looking at how people experience the world. Uh, they, they explain it as the study of the structure of subjective experience which is just a a slightly complex and uh, unnecessarily complicated way, I would say, of saying it's a study of how people perceive the world differently. Now, one of the things with NLP is that it spends a lot of time explaining how it is that people differ in their preferences when they're processing information that comes from the outside world. And the way that they came up with this understanding is by passing people's linguistic expressions. In other words, by looking at how people speak for expressions of their subjective experience. In other words, looking at what people say and what that tells us about how they experience the world. Now, I, if this seems very theoretical and difficult to understand, I appreciate that, and which is why we're going to make it very practical and very specific in just a moment. So, one of the concepts that NLP came up with is that people experience the world through their senses and obviously it's not NLP that came up with that particular aspect of it uh, but I will explain that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So your senses are sight, hearing, 
feeling. Those are the three primary ones. So if we look at the first one, and the, you know, in NLP they're called representational systems, it's not particularly important. But the point is that the first one is the visual channel, and that is sight. Now people who are predominantly visual, in other words people who prefer the visual system, they will typically speak in words that give away the fact that that's what they prefer. They will say things like, see what I mean, getting the picture, the future is bright. They will express their own opinions and feelings about things in visual expressions, like the word see, the word picture, the word bright. And these people have preferences in terms of how they behave and how they perceive the world that directly affect their lives. For example, these are people who are extremely, extremely careful about how they look and how their home and workspace looks. Typically these are people who are always very clean and groomed, they take really great care of themselves, they make sure that they look good and that their working space looks good. Often they will be prepared to sacrifice the practical comfort for their appearance. In other words, they might be prepared to sit in a chair that's not as comfortable as another chair just as long as it looks good or they might be prepared to wear clothes that make them look really good but are not comfortable. So the point I'm getting across to you here is that how people prefer to perceive the world affects how they behave. It affects the decisions that they make in life. People with a visual preference will also be very, very interested in visual materials. They will be interested in pictures, slides and videos. So they will consider that very important. If you're giving a presentation and you're not entertaining these people in a visual way, they will switch off and they will find it boring or they will start to find visual entertainment of another kind uh, by you know, looking at the funny aspects of your face or whatever it might be. In other words, if you're not catering to their visual needs, they're going to be turned off whatever it is that you're talking about. So it's really, really important that visually you engage them in some way. Now, incidentally, one thing that I would say to those of you who speak to people face to face is that a PowerPoint presentation that's based purely around text, like the one that I'm using here, is not a good way to engage people in general, but particularly visual people, because it's not the kind of thing they enjoy. A PowerPoint presentation for in-person training should probably be very, very little in terms of text and a lot of pictures and visual engagement of other kinds, whether that's a video or a picture that you talk about or, or a photograph that you explain or use to back up your point. That's the point. So that is really what you're, you're looking to add to any presentations that you run is something that visually engages people and text is not something that ordinarily will do that. Now people with an auditory preference, in other words people who experience the world predominantly through things connected with hearing, they're very different. They will use words that give away that preference. For example, instead of saying, "Does that? do you see what I mean? They will say, does that ring a bell? Or does that sound right? Um, they might also say, yeah, I, that resonates with me. These are words that give away a preference for sound related words or for hearing related words. And people with this preference are also different. They're very sensitive to sound, distracting or loud noises, a poor microphone if you're doing a webinar, the tonality and pitch of your voice will be very important and obviously any interference will put them off. The visual people may not pay so much attention to that. They may be able to ignore those things. But someone who's an auditory preference person, they will not be able to do that. Equally though, the visual aspects of your behavior and your presentation will be less important to them. So how you sound will affect the experience massively. And that's why it's really important that you always take on board what I said about breathing and the way you speak in previous webinars as well, because it 
massively affects their experience. If your voice does not sound pleasant or enjoyable for them to listen to, they're not going to listen to it. They're going to go inside the head and have a different experience or the only thing they'll be able to think about is the way you sound rather than what you're saying. So if you want to engage these people, you have to make sure that you are engaging them in that way. Your voice is compelling enough for them to listen to. The kinesthetic preference people are people who have a preference for feelings. And again, this is something that will be expressed in their words and phrases that they use. They will say, yeah, that feels right to me, or that doesn't feel right to me. When they're talking about, say, getting rid of some kind of problem, they won't say things like a visual person who will say, yeah, it's great to have that issue out of the picture. They will say, oh, it's like a weight off my shoulders. They experience it literally as something on their shoulders, as a weight. When they're talking about controlling something or managing something, they will say, let's get to grips with this issue. All of these words give away a preference for feeling and manipulating things with hands and the body. And to these people, hands-on tasks are very important. They like to touch things, they like to feel things, they like to do things. If you go to museums lately or um, a zoo or uh, you know something that's intended for large groups of people, you will often find that they're starting to cater to that much more. There are always things to do in a museum. There are always things to touch. There are always things to uh, try with your hands or to press a button to make something happen. And that's the museum's way of catering to that need. You know, I'm one of the, the people who has a, a, a feeling, a kinesthetic preference myself. And whenever I go anywhere, um, you know, I always want to touch whatever it is. If I get a tour of a, a naval ship, I want to touch the wheel or I want to touch the, the tourniquets or whatever it might be. It's just natural to me to process in that way. So if you have people like that, it's very important that you give them practical tasks to do. Otherwise, they're precisely the kind of people that will start fidgeting or playing with their pen or their phone or wherever it might be because they're not engaged in that way. And typically, these people, very much like myself, actually, are not going to be very interested in theory. They're interested in practical information that helps them, that it helps them achieve what they want. So the, if you start talking at length and in theoretical concepts about about something that has no practical value as far as they see, again, they're going to switch off and they're not going to listen to you. So what does this all mean? Well, before we look at that, let's look at something else, which is another aspect of NLP, again, another complex piece of jargon, uh, which just means preference. So when we talk about metaprograms, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> When we talk about metaprograms, all we're really talking about is a preference for the way people experience the world, the way people make decisions, and the way they speak. Now, there are a few, and really it's about how they sort information, but it's also about how they make decisions. And there are many of them, uh, but there are a few of them that are more important than others. I think probably one of the most important things that people... Uh, make, use to make decisions is they make decisions on the basis of their preference in terms of are they towards something or are they away from something. So if you speak to two different people about the reason that they live where they live, they will give completely different answers. For example, as someone who has a preference that's based on towards, they will say, oh, it's a great area, it has a great infrastructure, there's some lovely restaurants around here, it's great for my kids. I can get to work within 20 minutes, etc., etc. They will be emphasizing the things that drew them to that place. Someone else living in that same street with an away preference will experience it very differently. If you speak to one of them, what they will say is, yeah, well, I, I love this place because it allows me to get away from, uh, from the noise and the big crowds in the city. something that's very clearly away from. They might say, yeah, there's less crime here. So they're constantly referencing whatever it is that they're moving away from. And that is, again, an experience of the world. So if you want to motivate 
the person who is away to do something, emphasizing the positives in a purely towards way isn't really going to work. So if you want to get them to move to that area, you have to say to them, there's a lot less crime. Saying to them, it's a nice clean green area is not going to be such a draw because it's not something that's away from, it's something that's towards from. But if you said the same thing to them about the area being clean and green in an away way, that would be much more effective. So if you say to them, it would allow you to get away from the fumes and noise of the city, that suddenly is more powerful, even though the message is the same. A clean and green space is precisely that. So how you phrase something is very important. Another preference is self-others. Some people will talk and think predominantly of themselves. Others will be focused on other people. So again, if you ask someone why they move to the area that they live in, they, so, the, someone who's self-focused will talk about how it's important to them that they have A, B, C, D, and it was important to them to get away from A, B, C, D if they're an away person. Whereas someone who has a focus on others will talk about how they really wanted to get, give their children an opportunity to experience life in a different place or they wanted to make sure that their husband was this or their wife was that. They will talk about the people around them much more than they talk about themselves. And typically these are people who will make decisions on the basis of what's good and appropriate for others, not so much for themselves. And these people are the kind of people that typically will care for everyone else and not take very good care of themselves. Another thing that is a very big distinguisher between different people and is very important to know as a trainer that these exist is what's called an NLP chunkering preferences and all it really means very simply is the level of detail that people like and need to go into. And none of these by the way are right or wrong or good and bad all of them are just preferences. Now when it comes to chunking preferences, you will know people in your life who go into extreme detail about every single little thing. And those are the people who in NLP terms are chunkers down. In other words, they need to break everything down into tiny, tiny little bits of information and they really enjoy going into all those details and they need to go into those details in order to feel like they've properly understood something or they've properly communicated something. So someone very often who's over explaining something, they're not doing that because they think you're stupid, they're over explaining it because that is how they feel something has to be understood at that minute level of detail. There are other people who are what in NLP is called chunkers up and all they need is the big picture, they're not interested in all the details. They don't care about that. All they care about is the big picture and from the big picture they're satisfied. They feel like they've understood. If they need some details, they'll go and get them but for the most part, the big picture is enough. So the important thing to do here, having gone through the meta programs and having gone through the representational system, is to understand who you are understand what you are and what is your natural tendency when it comes to communication. So we talked about the fact that you will have a preference for being visual, auditory or feeling and we talked about the three meta programs which are towards and away, self, others, chunking up or chunking down or in other words liking detail or liking the bigger picture. Now whichever one you are will come out in your language and will come out in your behavior. For example, if you're someone who's visual, you will take great care of your appearance and that will come across when you're presenting to people face to face. If you're more feeling, feeling people tend to have a preference for wearing clothes that are above all comfortable and what that means is sometimes they're prepared to sacrifice what they look like and how they appear to other people for the comfort of wearing the thing that they like or the thing that they feel makes them uh, believe in themselves or whatever it might be, right? So if you're someone who is predominantly about feeling, you may want to pay extra attention to how you dress. But more importantly even than that, if you're someone who's a visual person or a feeling person, an auditory person, 
you will be speaking predominantly in those words. In other words, a visual person would consistently communicate in words that betray the pictures that lie behind their words, which is really great if you're only talking to other people who have the same preference as you. But it's not great if you're talking to a room of 20 people where everyone is different. And so as a trainer and as a presenter, you have a responsibility to first of all understand who you are and then to compensate for that by adding elements from the other words and the other representational system and the other meta programs. In other words, if you, if you are someone who is extremely towards, you have to remember that not everyone is motivated by the great things that you are drawn to. Or if you're someone who loves detail, you have to remember that there are people in the room who are not all that interested in detail, and if you start going into detail, they're going to start getting bored and annoyed. So what you have to do is find some kind of middle ground. You have to make sure that you're using visual words, you're using auditory words, you're using kinesthetic words, and they're using the other side of the meta programs that we talked about so that you're reaching everybody as much as you can. You've got to make sure you're not overdoing what your preference is. It's very, very tempting when, as a communicator to communicate the way that you feel comfortable. But remember how we talked about the fact that your focus has to be on the other people as a trainer, and what you have to do is focus on whatever it is that they need and communicating your message in the way that works best for them in order that they actually hear it. And the best way to do that is to identify what your preferences are. So if I've been talking about it and you found that, oh yeah, I'm an auditory person and I prefer to make decisions by moving away from things for the most part. And my focus is usually on other people and I like the detail. Then you've got to remember that you've got to offset that. If you're auditory, then you've got to add visual words and feeling words when you're speaking. If you're towards, you've got to make sure that you also, when you're motivating people in particular, not only talk about the positives, but also talk about the negatives that they avoid by making the decision that you're suggesting. If you're only focused on others, you talk to people about how their children will benefit and whatever. But you've also got to remember that some people are mo more focused on themselves. So you've got to talk about the benefits for them specifically. And if you're someone who loves detail, you've got to remember that not everyone loves detail and you've got to give the big picture and satisfy the people who want the big picture without going too far into the detail of it. In other words, you've got to work with everyone to satisfy all the different groups and that's a challenge. That's obviously a challenge, but you've got to go for it. If you want to be a more efficient communicator, that's what you've got to do. One of the biggest things as a leader and as a communicator that you have to do is you have to be responsible and you have to understand that if someone doesn't understand something you said, that is your responsibility as a communicator. Now, incidentally, I'm not saying that this is true. There will be situations where someone's lack of understanding is not your responsibility. It may be that they were not paying attention or it may be that they were not able to understand something because they're not intelligent enough or whatever it might be. But as an attitude, it's much better to believe that whenever anyone you're training doesn't understand something, it's your responsibility as the communicator. Because if you were not if they were not paying attention, what is it that you were not doing to engage them sufficiently? If they are not intelligent to understand what you said, what is it that you didn't do to make it simpler? So while it may not necessarily always be true, it's a really, really useful attitude to have as a communicator to always strive to learn and to improve your delivery if something isn't working. Confusion is the same thing. If someone is confused, it's your responsibility and it's your responsibility to clear up whatever needs to be cleared up. Now, this is a point where we normally have the question and answer session, but I, before we go into that, and I don't anticipate too many questions today, um, I want to talk a little bit about a few things uh, in terms of you know, the difficulties when you're training. For example, sometimes you might have people being rude or challenging. 
Uh, and one of the things that's important to realize is that very often it's got nothing to do with you. Uh, if you go to a lot of conferences with a lot of the same people, quite often you will find that it's the very same people exhibiting the very same behavior regardless of who is the speaker. You know, there are people, for example, who always ask a question. There are people who always ask a provocative question. There are always people who, instead of asking a question during the question and answer session, make a statement. And that is because that is their way of being. So it doesn't have anything to do with you necessarily that that's the way that they're behaving. And if someone is being difficult or challenging or whatever it is, you've got to remember that it's coming from them, as long as you obviously haven't triggered it in some way. And that is something that a lot of people worry about, but actually doesn't happen very much. You know, when you're training, the vast majority of people are very respectful and appreciative of what you're doing. Um, but if you do come across that, then just remember, probably has nothing to do with you. Okay. And uh, the other thing that I would say, probably the final thing for today. Uh, is you've got to remember that when you're speaking with people, the best way, you know, we talked about all the different words, the visual, the auditory, etc. But ultimately, you know, all communication is about how you make people feel. And so in, in that context, the best way to think about how you communicate is to speak to the people in front of you as if they're a close friend. Someone whose time and attention you genuinely appreciate. And know that they're happy to be there. And this brings me to the very final point I want to make, which is one of the th things pe people really struggle with, um, and this comes back to more to what I was saying in the first half of the webinar, is the temptation to interpret the looks you see on other people's faces as having something to do with you. In other words, if someone looks stern or grumpy or questioning or confused, it's very, very tempting to think that that is a message that they're sending you, but it really isn't. It really, really isn't, and it's something that you learn uh, with experience. You know, I've had many times when I've given a presentation and there's been a person who, every time I looked at them, I kind of thought, oh, okay, they're bored or they're not listening, and then afterwards, that person will come up to me at the end and say, oh, I really loved your presentation. I thought this was great and that was great. And I get from what they're saying that not only were they really paying attention and interested, they actually really enjoyed it. So some of that is cultural. People from different regions of the world express themselves in public differently. Uh, some people, for example, from Asia, uh, especially Japan, will have a, a kind of a polite, um, fixed expression of politeness regardless of what's going on inside. Uh, people from Nordic countries tend to have a very reserved look. Uh, people from southern countries tend to be the opposite. They're more expressive, they're more smiley. And how they feel inside is not necessarily reflected in that behavior. So rather than making judgments and jumping to conclusions about how people look and feel to you, just know that you've got to do your job and that's all you've got to do. And then how people respond to that is up to them. You just got to let go of any attachments you have to people responding in a certain way in that moment. So I haven't had any questions, uh, which is quite natural. As I said, most of you are choosing to attend this webinar in your own time. If you do have questions, please send them to me afterwards, as I said. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. I hope you get something useful out of it, and it's useful for your career as a trainer, as a presenter, whatever it is that you choose to do with these skills. So thank you for attending and I'll see you in future webinars.